Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Pure in Heart show. This is part eight of Edward Shree's Men, Women and the Mystery of Love. Wonderful book and you're most welcome. We love to have you listening to us. Uh, remember to share this YouTube channel, both Radio Maria, if you're listening to Radio Maria YouTube channel and Pure in Heart YouTube channel. Share it with your friends, comment, subscribe, like and do all those nice things that YouTubers say. Uh, Still trying to get used to this. Um, but yes, you're most most welcome. So we've got a couple of really nice events coming up uh, in the short term and in the slightly medium term as well. So, Yeah, indeed. So we have our Pursuit of Love conference. So it's really, really important uh, that people email RSVP because we need to know how much charcuterie boards we need to order. So it's very important. Important decisions, guys. So. You really need to email uh, info at pureandhard.ie. It, it will be a day conference. Um, we'll start with mass at 11 o'clock. There's going to be talks from Maria and Neil Steen from the Nazareth Family Institute. Father Allen, who has a doctor in theology of the body. He's our spiritual director of Pure and Heart. Legend. Um, there's going to be also David Quinn from Iona <coughs> Institute. There also will be some couple testimonies. So be very much so really beautiful, great, uh, just a fruitful day, I suppose. And just very important for you if you're kind of like want to know more about the whole, I suppose, Christian Catholic dating and marriage and engagement and all that kind of stuff. All to do with love relationships. Uh, this would be a fantastic day. And also if you want to meet people to socialize, it also be a great day. Uh, so it's going to go on until the evening. Our plan is to finish the adoration at six, around six. Uh, and then afterwards, it's going to be just chat and social, some dancing as well. Um, so I've been uh, doing my dancing classes, but I, I <laughs> it's a it's a dance yourself fish class I do. So it's like, oh, uh, it's unfortunately, it's not couple dancing. So it's like uh, you're dancing and there's an instructor, but she teaches us um, like, um, what's it called? Couple steps, like a ballroom step. So we do like um, jive, we do salsa. So it's like it's kind of in a fast, upbeat pace. And so like she teaches us the steps, we do the steps and we're moving and all that. And it's kind of trying to get our fitness. So anyway, so we have, that to look forward to um, and that is on the 16th of December Saturday the 16th um, so please email us if you're uh, hoping to come because um, we really need to know the numbers um, before the 16th um, so info at pureandheart.ie and then people have been wondering are we doing something uh, Christmas dinner and we are yeah. we're doing it and we're doing it during the 12 days of Christmas which is the best time to do it Mm -hmm. And not before, <laughs> like most people do the Christmas parties, December sometime. Nah, we are just within, just within the Christmas 12 days, just towards the end. <laughs> Amen. So the 5th of January in the Morrison Hotel in Dublin 1 in the city centre. Um, so we really invite you, friends, family, and there's no age restriction on this. So we really encourage you to come. It's our annual fundraiser. It's a big fundraiser for um, our mission, for the work that we do. Um, so really important, but Pure in Heart is actually the only, in Ireland, we're the only right now um, over all the other countries Pure and Heart International. So Pure and Heart is in uh, England, Wales, America, Liberia, Haiti. So it's in other parts of the world. But only in Ireland can we go and share the message of chastity and God's plan for love and marriage. So this is a big gift and it shows a big need in our church. And we need a lot of help to continue our ministry, to continue our mission work. And we also help with our brothers and sisters overseas. So we do work with them. We have a few projects collaborating with them. Um, and so we really need your support. So if you can come or you'd like to just even donate to the to the Christmas fundraiser. Um, so please, please do, please do so. So it's on our website as well, pureinheart.ie. It's on our events page and also... Um, Forward slash see. donate, I think, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's another separate. Yeah. So um, really encourage you. It'd be a great night. Uh, there'd be a lovely meal and we'll have a raffle. We'll have also um, people love. Actually, Pure Heart, I, we've had this really good uh, turnout when we do anything to do with dancing. Lots of people just want to come. Yeah. Um, very popular events. So we'll have dancing, we'll have music. Um, it'll be a great night out. So we mm. just encourage you to spread the word. That's on the 5th of January. And really, really important that we need to know by the 30th of December, people need to RSVP because the orders have to go into the hotel. 
Um, so we need people to RSVP by the 30th of December. It's very, very important because um, all the payments and all the orders have to be done by then. So uh, we would love if you could do that. Um, be great. And just another shout out for our Thursday prayer meetings, because really that's what makes Pure and Heart tick. Uh, it's the people that show up every Thursday. They come. They're really amazing. That's how you really get involved in Pure and Heart. If you're interested in getting to know us better, come to one of our meetings, 7 p.m. Thursday, and they are fantastic meetings. Mm. Personally, I think they're the best prayer meetings in Dublin mm -hmm. because they have everything. They have, we start with rosary, then we have mass and opportunity confession during rosary before mass and after mass during adoration time. And after that, we've got a talk and after that, we've got a social. It really is amazing. It's an all-rounder. It's like a mini retreat in the middle of the week and it is phenomenal. I love Pure in Heart for that and I've been coming for as long as I can remember. Praise the Lord. Yeah, brilliant prayer meetings. Amazing. And it's just fantastic. Like there's been such great people um, and there's been like people that right now are my friends like I met, I met them and I remember uh, their first time coming into Pure and Heart and I remember meeting them at the door and they came in and uh, they didn't know like I asked their name and I was like welcome how do you Pure and Heart and they're like I don't know they're just so <laughs> nervous <laughs> so like, I don't okay. know how I got here <laughs> <laughs> that's okay you're here and I remember them saying to me they're like kind of going walking up the stairs and they're like is, is everybody here that goes here young like us? I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a prayer group for young people. It's a youth group. Um, and they were just blown away. And yeah. they were like, they were just like, wow, like where where, where are these like, are these young people? Where have they been? Like I yeah, haven't yeah. seen them in my parish. I haven't seen them, you know, since I left secondary school, okay. haven't been to, to church with the sure. other young people. And it's just amazing to hear that. And it's just so beautiful. And and, and I remember like they were saying like, oh, and are they Christian? Like, yeah. <laughs> they, could, yeah. They actually believe in God. Yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> They're Catholic. But every time somebody, people come to me at prayer meetings as well, saying, like, Jeepers, wow, where have all these young people been my whole life? You know, I was one of those people one, once upon a time. But now there's so many different prayer, prayer groups and prayer meetings and different groups and charisms and organizations around Dublin doing similar things. Pure is still the best, by the way. I'm joking. Uh, that it's like, I always tell them, your world is about to get a whole lot bigger. Because they suddenly find you suddenly find one prayer group and then you find them all. Mm -hmm. So really, 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 even like if you can't always make it on a Thursday night, come along once mm -hmm. and we'll tell you all about other things that are happening around the city that you might be able to get to on your other nights that might be freer. So and it's just it's really worthwhile just the friends you'll make in a community like Pure and Heart. Like, I mean, you don't find that in the rest of society, the world out there. Yeah. You just don't. It's really, truly special and it's worth coming along. So I really recommend the prayer meetings. Amen. Okay, shall we begin with a prayer? Fire away. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace the Lord, Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed art thou among women, women and, and blessed is the fruit, fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity now and at the hour of our death amen, amen. our lady queen of peace pray for us and our lady of Guadalupe. pray for us amen the father son the holy spirit, holy spirit. Amen. amen beautiful i really like that prayer i say that every time i really like that prayer i just have to remark it every single time yeah it's really beautiful okay so we're still in uh chapter four so we're almost finished we're on question six ah, so yes. You were talking about idealization and um, media and movies and how they romanticize love. So, How can you guard against even unintentionally using others or being used by them emotionally? That's tough. I mean, it's not, in practice, it's not always that easy because every situation takes a different form. The only thing that maybe we could say really or that anybody could really say is just have your broad spectrum uh, sort of priorities in check. You know, if you continually walk towards God and have your eyes fixed on him and are in touch, like we spoke in the last in the last episode, um, if you're in touch with what real love is, then that's going to filter through in some way. You're going to be able to have a metric against which you can check yourself to see if you're idealizing somebody or if you're using somebody or if you're moving towards that sort of self-centered, self-gratification self kind of um, uh, posture rather than self-giving. Like, do I really want what's best for the other person? Am I expecting something in return? Uh, what do you think, Helen? Um, I think... Yeah, I definitely don't know if I should be the one that <laughs> to be giving this advice, but um, I think that um, 
Yeah, I agree with you, Boundaries. I think that it's important. It goes back to probably maybe two or three episodes at the beginning when we were talking about um, knowing your boundaries before you go into a relationship. Mm. So yes. journaling them, bringing them in front of Jesus, writing them out so that you are, they're kind of like guidelines for you. It's kind of like, um, you know, your your guide, I suppose. Um, mm. So you already know, and that in that way you already know, okay, so you have your whatever kind of, non-negotiables um, mm. or your priorities or what you're looking for in another person and what you also hope to be. I think it's really important to look at both. Don't just be thinking of the other yes. person has to be this, 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 this. How can I also be these things, you know? Don't be Super expecting... Super important. Almost more important. <laughs> Almost more important. Both are, I think, equally important. But yeah. so, like introspection. One thing I'd recommend is travel with your friends. Now, this is kind of bizarre piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> Get your best buddies and travel with them because you learn more from four days abroad with your best mates than you will about yourself. You learn more about yourself than you will from a, a year long relationship because um, your best buddies aren't going to hide their feelings from you um, normally. And you'll be you'll be acutely aware then of of your own shortcomings, what you're expecting of other people. And are you dishing out what you're receiving? You know, uh, just in in a friendly relational kind of way, you know, which fundamentally is what what will make the relationship tick that you're hoping to get into someday. You know, if you if you really want to get married, if you want to pursue that that uh, vocation, uh, if you're going to be in a relationship with a member of the opposite sex, you're going to fundamentally need a friendship with them. Right. And you need a, a healthy friendship. And the rules that determine a healthy friendship are the same ones that re, will determine a friendly, like friendly and healthy daily interaction uh, in your relationship or your marriage, you know, because they have to be your friend. You have to be able to the same principles apply, let's say, of needing to put the good of the other before yourself. And if we are in any way self-centered or self-serving, um, that will show up immediately. Uh, in close quarter situations with friends, especially if there's tension, if you're depending on each other in a more intense way than, than you might normally, if you're just sort of meeting up for movie night or going out to the pub or whatever. Like, if you travel with your friends, you're in new situations, you're in uncharted territory, you're trying to navigate things together in a way that you're depending on each other and you're relying on each other and... It brings out different dynamics and you do learn an awful lot about yourself. You really, really do. And learn from it, you know, and, and put that into practice in your everyday life so that when you get into a relationship, you'll be aware of your tendencies and your shortcomings. Uh, there's a huge overlap. That's what I'm trying to say. I think you could also do that in um, getting involved. I think any relationship when they're, when they're discerning, they have to be involved in some sort of community that they have mm. to both be involved in. So that could be soup kitchens that could be um helping with uh the sisters helping with the elderly helping camps whatever that might be don't you don't necessarily have i, I wouldn't i wouldn't go abroad one-to-one -one. i would be very uh, me personally and uh, other advice from other uh priests would be kind of you know it would be don't think you need to go one-to-one -one. would say good idea yes to go away with friends you know more than one person you know um just in terms of boundaries physical boundaries um, and trying to be chaste is just really important. Um, you know, it would be really highly, I suppose, not majority of what couples would do. And I don't think you need to go abroad in order to find out your, if you're meant for each other to marry or not. But in a group setting, it's different and it's good. I also think it's really important that you're on the same level plane. You're on the same field um, because it's a massive difference when um, it's like a group and uh, you're leading it um, and, you know, there's so much else going on there that's that's completely different. Whereas if you're going as a fun thing, it's a fun trip, everybody's on the same page, everybody is, you know, everyone is trying to, to make the most out of this. It's so much better, it's so much, it's it's very well, you know. Um, mm. It's just, I think you have to be careful of where you put yourself in what situations as well, you know. Um, mm. Because sometimes you can you can have super high expectations of, of, of someone and uh, it, it might not be met. And it's not because of that person is not meeting them. It's because of the circumstances or the conditions around uh, that time are not working in your favor. It can be a lot of that aspect as well. 
I don't know. I just think it's important that you you also need to be in um, group settings in terms of serving. <coughs> Seeing how the other person serves is really, really important because marriage is about serving. It's servitude. Yeah. It's being able to say no to yourself, to say yes to the other person. So uh, the best way to see that is in, um, is in ways where you're both invested in um, a common project or um, equally, you know, you're both equally invested in this um, and you're both equally helping this out. And it's not just a one soft thing. It's not just, a, oh, yeah, I helped it. I helped out uh, the soup kitchens once, you know, because the first time is always going to be the great time. It's like it's like the first date. It usually goes well, you know, it's afterwards. It's the consistency um, you know, seeing the, pa is there any patterns com coming up? And that only happens over time. And you need to give it a bit of time. You won't know after one volunteering night or after one date, if that's the person you're going to marry. Mm -hmm. If you do, wow, like that's definitely has been a revelation from, I, I suppose, like, you know, God has really ordained this and this is meant to be. But majority of the time, that's not going to happen. You need consistency is key and you yeah. need to, to observe the patterns that are happening. Yeah, I mean, you really see some of these two colors, like they really kind of have to be pushed to a point where they're really kind of uncomfortable. Um, it's sort of, no, I'm not saying you're you're the one pushing, you're not, you shouldn't ever be, really. It should be, you should be in situations like Helen was saying, that's actually a really good idea, getting involved. If you're dating somebody and you want to really get to know, like, are they capable of serving and of putting others before themselves? get involved in like a soup kitchen or something like that. It's a really good idea, like where they're actually serving. And over time then, as Helen was saying, you'll see the person's true colors. The first time you do it together, they're going to be on their best behavior because they know that you're watching them from the other side of the room. And afterwards, they're not going to be complaining all night to you about how, how difficult or laborious it was, or that you know this person was messy, they were whatever. They're not going to do that the first time because again, they like even the most self-centered person has a limit up to which point they can portray the best version of themselves or the version that they want you to see. But it's over time where that wears thin and you'll start seeing the person's real reactions, how they're actually, you know, feeling about the situation really. Mm. Um, so I think that's very good. Time is something that is invaluable. So that's why, that's another reason why we say don't rush things. If you're in a discernment, don't rush it. Um, there's an argument to be made for not dragging it on too long either, but right now we're focusing on, okay, how long does it take for you to really get to know somebody? If you're doing things the right way, you can sort of fast track it a little bit, but really every person's different. And you do have to see this person in a wide variety of different situations in order to be able to really see the person for who they are. Again, the whole oxytocin thing, uh, chastity, boundaries, physical boundaries as well, emotional boundaries, helps you to keep a sober, uh, perspective on the person helps you to be able to see the person for who they really are and be able to identify red flags where they where they occur. Um, but yeah, really super idea. Well mm -hmm. done, <laughs> fantastic. I also would add as well to that. I would say family. Seeing how they are, rea how do they uh, react to their family? Um, how do they um, get along with their family? Obviously, yeah. there, okay, there's some some families where it's not ideal and they're very broken marriages or very broken individuals in the family and they're, you might not be able to see them. That has happened. But if it is sound, let's say it's a sound, you know, sound enough, sound family, even, even still, actually, I'm going to take that back. Even still, even if there are difficult members in their family, it's actually really important to see how they treat them. Because yeah. how you treat the least of these brethren of mine is how you treat me, um, is what the Lord says. So it's like mm -hmm. the people who are the least convenient or the people that you don't really get along with, how do they treat them? They could be family members, it could be whoever that is in their life. Um, but I think family is just really important, the way they treat their family um, and the way they treat the, your family, like the opposite, you know, when you're spending time. Do they equally prioritize them like they do their own? Do they give them the same um, time, the same um, acknowledgement, the same um, care, the same concern, um, assertiveness? Mm. Do they give that the same level? Or do they give more to their family? And that's really important to notice that because it should be almost parallel. It should be almost like, almost the same. They should care just yeah. as much about yours as they care about theirs. Um, and I think it's really important. It's a very important dynamic to watch, to see. Um, yeah, even family culture as well. Now we're diverging a little bit from the question here, but it's important, I think, to say, like, if you're getting to know somebody, ultimately you're getting to know them, to marry them, to have a family with this person. You have to see what kind of family culture they grow up in. 
in order to be able to really know what their image of family is going to be like when they have a family with you. Uh, because even just, I mean, it's most likely not going to be it's too much of a surprise, but, you know, each family is very different. And you'll see the way they interact with each other. That's, that's the image that the person you're discerning with has of a family, uh, as functional or dysfunctional as it might be. But as Helen was saying, obviously, how they, how they react in the face of dysfunctionality within their family is super important. Um, because, again, the most difficult one, remember, uh, we were talking about before, St. Therese and the nagging nun uh, who, was, who was bickering and, and giving out and complaining the whole time. That was her moment to really show true love uh, in the face of whatever might any normal normal person that isn't that far along the road to sanctity might consider an intolerable situation. Whereas she said in that moment, she could have the opportunity, she could have had the opportunity to be with her friends in the beauty salon or to be here with this nagging nun serving her. And she says, no, nah, I'd do this any day because this is real love. This is true. Like I'm living, I'm actually alive. I'm progressing. I'm giving of myself. I'm actually growing, you know, and growing closer to God. Uh, so yeah, don't lose track of that. That's good. Good advice. So question six, how can you guard against... Oh, we did that. Question seven. Yeah. According to John Paul II, women tend to struggle more with sentimentality. That's true. A woman's inherent, inherently sensitive nature, however, is part of what contributes to her true attractiveness and beauty. In his apostatic letter on the dignity and vocation of women, John Paul II stated that grace never casts nature aside or cancels it out but rather perfects it and ennobles it. How can women embrace those feminine qualities that make them unique without becoming overly sentimental in their relationships? How can they help other women to do the same? For sure. The second part is, how can women embrace those feminine qualities that make them unique without becoming overly sentimental in their relationships? I think that one's for you, Helen. Yeah, that's like <laughs> I can't really, I can't really speak to that very much. But I will say now again, this is general generalization. There are very sensitive men as well in the world, you know, and men aren't immune to sentimentality. That's another thing that I think a lot of people think men have the emotional range of a teaspoon. To quote Hermione Granger, uh, but it's not true. This is this is another thing. Men feel things very deeply. Um, very often men are quite reactive. So therefore they will, first of all, fall in love madly with a girl. They'll go for this whole thing. They'll be totally head over heels for her and they'll be hurt. And then they'll completely shut down because they'll be proactive and reactive in an unusual kind of, kind of way. Um, when it comes to subsequent relationships and interactions with the opposite sex. So I think this, this can happen more with men. Um, but it's not to say that we aren't originally sentimental. We aren't, it's not like we're not predisposed to it. And some men are always very sentimental, uh, different levels of set, uh, sensitivity um, and, and empathetic. So it's, again, these are generalizations. We're just speaking generally. This tends to affect women in certain ways and men in other ways. But uh, yeah, this question is phrased mostly towards women. So. Yeah, but I also want to say something to that. Like, yes, totally agree with what you're saying. And it's, yeah, it's a very good point that you're making, especially from mm. a man's perspective, because it is something that women tend to think that, oh, no, he doesn't get it. You know, the guy's not going to get it. Um, so that's a really good point. But I also think it's also really important for men to know that women are also more um, naturally maybe inclined to be sensitive simply by mm -hmm. our biological structure, the way we have more neurons than a man would because of our capacity to bear life. And we need that in order to sustain life. Uh, so as a result of that and our hormones and all that, like that, there's that biological factor, which is really important. And I think it's very important to understand that in terms of the complementarity of, of, the, of, the, of the sexes. Um, because I think that men sometimes might think that, um, you know, they, that's the thing. It's like, oh, women and men are so different and we're such different worlds. And to some extent it's true because, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's difficult to kind of navigate that and bring that together and kind of going back to like, okay, so from a woman's perspective for the feminine qualities, like personally, I would really struggle. I personally would really struggle with that because, um, me personally, um, it's just, I think you also are very conditioned from your background, like how you, and that's not your own fault, but 
the way you've been brought up is really important. And I'm not to say to discourage men to date women that don't don't come from, um, you know, whole families or whatever. Like, that's not true at all. Um, but I just think that it's something that um, I think women also, maybe there is a bit of an expectation on them as well. Um, that they have to have this kind of, there's always like in terms of dating, there can be this expectation that especially if you're trying to keep it chaste, it's like, oh, well, it's the woman, you know, she's the one who lures the guy. She's the one who, who uh, brings out that sentimentality aspect in him. And she's the one that is trapping him. And it's a lot, like a lot of tames, tames the monster, tames the beast, isn't that the... Yeah. <laughs> somebody used yeah, once. like the, 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 it's like the base on the woman. Yeah. So if the woman is pure, the man will be pure. You know, and I'm like, oh, oh right, okay, like, yeah, the, yeah. like that kind of thing. I'm like, mm, maybe, but I think it goes both ways. You need both there. But I think women, like in terms of sentimentality, like I think that you know, women, um, how we can, how can we help each other to help other women to do the same without mm. becoming overly sentimental? I think it goes back to the idea of idealizing. And um, women are, we have this big imagination and we fantasize and we love to imagine this. We love to imagine our wedding day, our like our dress, like what we're going to look like, what our kids are going to look like. Like we just have this huge capacity to just go away and just <laughs> fantasize and just go flying around. And I think that's the danger. I think it starts in the mind, like an, like anything, like any sin or any mm. any kind of concupiscence, like it starts in the mind first. So I feel like if we as women um, help ourselves to be more rooted in scripture, more rooted in Christ, more rooted um, in prayer um, and trusting that God has a good plan for us, um, and not projecting all these fantasies on the next good looking guy that comes our way or the next interested guy that comes our way, you know, and, you know, trying to get him to, you know, stay and commit and do all these things. I think it's really important to let, um, I think I'm rambling a bit here, but I think it's also really important to let, since women can have too much persuasion with their sentimentality that, we can sometimes hinder what is meant to naturally happen. Um, so I think it's important for, for, speaking for myself as well, I think it's really important to allow the man to be a man, allow him to um, to to lead, like to be the head of this relation, to be the head, of, like in the future, he's going to be the head of the family. Um, I think it's really important that women have, we have this mastermind capacity to, in a bad way to manipulate situations using sentimentality, using the emotions, using playing on that kind of way. And I think that's something that we need to be conscious and aware and surrender. Um, I think if we learn to surrender to God, that will help us to surrender to the man, to surrender, to allow him to, um, in a sense, navigate this relationship and lead this relationship. Because I think women can have this tendency that we can just jump the gun or want this or want that. And, and we can be super sentimental as a result of just being too much in our minds, like fantasizing this and wanting this. Oh, finally, I have this. Finally, I have this great guy that's super interested in me. Oh, amazing. Okay, let's start talking about this. Oh, I want to know this. I want to know that. What does he think about that? And you're just like trying like mm. to to squish everything and squeeze everything out of him. Yeah, and it's monopolize like, him, I suppose. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I don't know if there's uh, making sense in what I'm trying to say. I'm yeah, just trying I suppose to if, if men have a tendency to objectify the body of the woman, the woman might have a tendency to monopolize the man. It's something we both have a separate struggles. It's like we have to try and work on, you know, um, again, it's it's about this sort of relinquishing our own desire and, and control to des desire to control the situation um, in a bizarre way. I mean, men and women are just built so differently, but we're so similar as well. Um, you know, we ultimately desire the same things, but we have different weaknesses and different uh, different strengths. And also, the very first episode that we did for this book series, you did a very good point for women. You said that, um, and this is related to sentimentality, because it's like, there's a very early stages of relationship, it's based on kind of sentimentality. And you mentioned yeah. that, if you're unsure of what the motivations of the guy is, or what his intentions are, and you're like, 
what's going on and you know your emotions are all in a flux and you're like what's happening as a man your advice was um just be chill just you know don't like have what was it you said like have your if he's not giving or not expressing the um, that he's intentional or that he's going somewhere or doing something with oh, you. Oh, yes. Just treat it as if it's not the case. As if it's not the case, yeah. Yeah. That was it. That would probably be a good go-to. Um, yeah. I, I think I'd stand over that today as well. <laughs> I think, yeah. So, the, but it, just a quick recap. It was, uh, if you are being frustrated by a man, like, okay, is he pursuing me? Is he not? Is he going to ask me out on the second date? Or is he going to ask me out on the first date? Is he not? Are we something? Are we not? If these questions are in your head, don't allow yourself to get sucked into that black hole. Just act as though it's not, you know? And if he really wants to pursue you, then he will. Uh, just don't allow you, don't, don't give yourself a headache. That's what I'm saying. Don't give yourself a headache over it because he mightn't even be aware, you know, like, well, he probably isn't aware, you know, of, of what you're going through. For him, the situation might look completely different in his mind. You know, he, he'll be picking up on different things to you, completely different things. His focuses will be different things. His priorities will be different. Um, so if a man really wants to pursue, he will. And that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, you can make yourself available, but don't give yourself a headache. You know, if he's not pursuing you, just treat it, treat it as though, if you're not sure you're something, treat it as though you're nothing until he makes it clear. I think that's excellent advice for the whole sentimentality thing of a woman. Yeah. How can a woman embrace the fail qualities? safe? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very good. Okay. So question eight, what are the aspects of a potential romantic relationship that divert us from asking the crucial question, is it really so? How can you strive to evaluate your relationships from a more integrated, uh, truthful, and objective perspective? Wow, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. What are the aspects of a potential rela romantic relationship that divert us from asking the crucial question, is it really so? I think we can uh, try to live the dream too much and we can really desperately want this relationship to work because we've been through so many relationships in the past and we've been lonely for such a long time or we haven't been dating ever before and we really want this one to be the one for whatever reason and we have it so loaded that we almost will do we'll go to any lengths to con ourselves uh to try and believe that this is the one but this is this is trying to keep control over the situation our, ourselves trying to exert control oh i'm gonna dig my claws in and just dig my head in the sand because i want it to work i i i i want to control this i want to believe this rather than relinquishing it all to god you know, uh, it's just, it's something we, we all struggle with, but it's, I suppose it's an, it's a, to varying degrees, uh, just how advanced or how rudimentary our relationship was, is with God and how accustomed we've become to trusting him, uh, fundamentally, but obviously there's a lot more to be said than that. What do you think? I agree. It's beautifully said. Yeah. 1%. Um, yeah. how can you strive to evaluate your relationships from a more, uh, truthful objective, yes, relinquishing it to God. Uh, that's what you said. Yeah. Um, and it's adoration. Really so. Adoration, 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 adoration. Yeah. <laughs> when we try to control things ourselves, it just doesn't work out. Okay. Chapter five. Okay, far away. The law of the gift, understanding the two sides of love. The Italians have a beautiful expression for love. Do you want to say it? Ti voglio bene. <laughs> I love that actually. It's really nice. It's like I will, I will your good. I will your well-being. Though commonly translated as "I love you," "ti voglio bene" more yeah. literally means "I wish you good" or "I want what is good for you." This phrase reminds us that love is not primarily about what good feelings may be stirring within. Even less, it is about what I can get out of a relationship for myself. The fullness of love is looking outward toward my beloved and seeking what is best for that person, not just what is good for me. This, in fact, is how the Catechism of the Catholic Church defines love. To love is to will the good of another. Catechism 1766, Thomas Aquinas. It's also a point John Paul II makes when he discusses the two sides of love, the subjective and objective. According to John Paul II, understanding the difference between the subjective and objective is crucial for any married, engaged, or dating relationship. As we have seen in earlier chapters, the inner dynamic of emotional love, 
sentimentality, and physical desire, sensuality, largely shapes how men and women interact with each other. And it is what makes a romance, especially in its early stages, so thrilling for the couple involved. John Paul II calls this first side of love the subjective aspect. While this is one aspect of love, it is not to be equated with love in the fullest sense. We know from experience that we can have <coughs> powerful feelings for another person without in any way being committed to them, or without that person being committed to us in relationship or self as love. This is why John Paul II puts the subjective aspect of love in its proper place. He wakes up and reminds us that no matter how intensely we experience these sensations, it is not, it is not necessarily love, but simply a psychological situation. Yes. In other words, on its own, the subjective aspect of love is no more than a pleasurable experience happening inside of me. And these powerful sensations might actually conceal the reality of a relationship that has failed to develop fully. So turning love inward. Men and women today are quite susceptible to falling for this illusion of love. For the modern world has turned love inward, focusing primarily on the subjective aspect. John Paul II, however, emphasizes that there is another side of love that is, abs that is absolutely essential no matter how powerful our emotions and desires may be. This is what he calls love's objective aspect. This aspect has objective characteristics that go beyond the pleasurable feelings of the subjective level. True love involves virtue, friendship, and the pursuit of a common good. Both people are focused on a common goal outside of themselves. In a Christian marriage, for example, a husband and wife unite themselves to the common aims of helping each other grow in holiness, deepening their own union and raising children. Most of all, true love involves the selfless pursuit of what is best for the other person, even if it means sacrificing one's own preferences and desires. Love in the sense of ti voglio bene. When considering the objective aspect of love, I must discern what kind of relationship exists between my beloved and me in reality, not simply what this relationship means in my feelings. Am I committed to this other person for who she is or for the enjoyment I receive from the relationship? Does my beloved understand what is truly best for me? And does she have faith and virtue to help me get there? Are we deeply united in a common aim, serving each other, and serving and striving together toward a common good that is higher than each of us? Or are we just living side by side, sharing resources and occasional good times together while we selfishly pursue our own interests and enjoyments in life? These are kinds of these are the kinds of questions that get the objective aspect of love. Now we can see why John Paul II says that is that true love is an impersonal fact. Interpersonal. Interpersonal fact, sorry. Uh, true love is an interpersonal fact, not just a psychological situation. A strong relationship is based on virtue and friendship. Unless a man and woman have the objective aspects of love in their relationship, they do not yet have a bond of true love. Knowing the difference between these two aspects of love is crucial when uh, within marriage as well. What will spouses do in moments when the subjective feelings of love fade? A husband may not always have strong romantic feelings for his wife, but he is still called to serve her and make sacrifices for her. A woman may at times feel frustrated with her husband, but she may still honor and serve him. She must still honor and serve him. Will I really seek the good of my spouse even when I don't feel like it, when I'm busy, when I'd rather be doing something else? Or what about when my spouse upsets me? It's easy to love when we get a lot in return, but the objective aspect of love reminds us that true love is not merely about my experience of good feelings in marriage, but the commitment to seek what is best for the other person, even when those feelings are not there. Ti voglio bene. As Jean Paul II puts it, love as experienced should be subordinated to love as virtue. Love as experienced should be subordinated to love as virtue. So much so, that without love as virtue, there can be no fullness in the experience of love. Hmm. 
the two sides of love. Subjective aspect of love, a psychological situation, the feelings I experience. Spontaneous reactions to sexual value based on sensual attraction to the, other, to the other's body, emotional attraction to the other's masculinity, femininity. Develops quickly, arises spontaneously without much effort. So that's the subjective aspect of love. Then the other side, which is the objective aspect of love, an interpersonal fact, the relationship in reality, union of persons based on virtuous friendship, pursuit of common good, seeking what's best for the other, self-giving love, Total commitment and sense of responsibility for the other person. That's a really good one. It develops over time. So here we go. It develops over time. And it requires much effort and grace. So Jesus. To cultivate virtuous self-giving love. So you need Jesus for this kind of love. Mm. Okay. Self-giving love. One of the chief hallmarks of the objective aspect of love is the gift of self. John Paul II teaches that what makes betrothed married love different from all other forms of love, such as attraction, desire, and friendship, is that two people give themselves to each other. They are not just attracted to each other. They do not simply desire what is good for each other. In betrothed love, each person surrenders himself entirely to the other. When betrothed love enters into this interpersonal relationship, something more than friendship results. Two people give themselves each to the other. Yet the very idea of self-giving love raises some important questions. How can one person give himself to another? What does this mean? After all, John Paul II himself teaches that each human person is utterly unique. Each person has his own mind and his own free will. In the end, no one else can think for me. No one else, no one else can choose for me. Each person is his own master and is not able to be given over to another. So in what sense can one person give himself to his beloved? John Paul II responds by saying that while on the natural and physical level it is impossible, in the order of love, a person can do so by choosing to limit his freedom and uniting his will to the one he loves. In other words, because of his love, a person may actually desire to give up his own free will and bind it to the other person. Love makes the person want to do just that surrender itself to another to the one it loves just a little comment on i heard a song the other day it was more or less saying about you know I, there was a, a breakup and it was like i wish i could hate you it'd be easier that way but you did nothing wrong and i was thinking about this idealization of kind of of the other person and if we fall into the trap of, of raising them up on an impossible pedestal and idealizing them uh, in an irrational, sort of disordered way, we're also then liable to demonize them in a delusional way as well. And very often this is a coping mechanism, like if, you something, if there's a breakup or something like this, you, you rationalize breaking up with this person moving away because you demonize them in your head and it can, it can but work both ways, which is actually terrifying. So if you fall into the trap of idealizing somebody, you can also demonize them as well, because and neither will have anything to do with the actual person you're dealing with. The image you have of the person in your head will never be as the person is, unless you're plugged into the reality of love, which is another way of looking at it, which is terrifying, I think. Wow. But I mean, it's good to keep it in perspective because this happens to us as well. Like the temptation is if you if we put somebody up on a pedestal that's impossible to, to attain and they prove themselves to be human and fall, then the more sentimentally inclined people, whether it's men or women, like will, will then naturally, they're going to have a terrible image of the person in their head then. Mm. They're, they're going to fall from the sky right down to hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? The person is going to be evil incarnate then because you're it's an emotional reaction just like it because you were never looking at the person for they were it was always just the subjective internal experience of what you imagined they were or were hoping that they would be and then once they fall from that stature they fall terribly in your in your own head again nothing to do with the real person so i don't know wow that's really good that's uh, that's really important that was very needed i think a lot of people we know the idealization but then the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin. Yeah. The cause that, that, that can happen as a result of it. Yes. Um, yeah. 
and I think that so many times that is so true. Like I can even say like in my own experience, it has yeah. happened. Like it's just my own experience too. Yeah. It's just yeah, it's really common. It's a very human thing. Just like idealizing is a human thing, demonizing is also a very human thing. It's just the same same coin, different side. Yeah. Scary stuff. Anyway. Freedom to love. Freedom to love. Jeepers. Which page is this now? I'm actually losing. For, it. Now. for example, Go consider for what happens when a man marries. As a single man, Bob is able to decide what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and the way he wants to do it. He sets his own schedule. He decides where he lives. He can quit a job and move to another part of the country in an instant if he so desires. He can keep his apartment messy. He can spend his money as he pleases. He can eat what he wants, go out when he wants, or go to bed when he wants. He's used to making life decisions on his own. Marriage, however, will significantly change Bob's life. If Bob decides on his own to quit his job, buy a new car, or go on a weekend vac vacation, or sell the home, this is probably not going to go over very well with his wife. And if Bob is married, all the decisions that he used to make by himself must be made in union with his wife and with a view to what is best for their marriage and their family. In self-giving love, men and women recognize in a profound way that their life is not their own. They have surrendered their life, their will, to their beloved. Their own plans, dreams and preferences are not completely abandoned, but they are now put in a new perspective. They are subordinated mm. to the good of the spouse and any children that may flow from their marriage. How they spend their time, their money and how they order their lives are no longer a matter of private choice. The marriage and the family become the primary reference points for everything they do. This is the beauty of self-giving love. As single people, we have great autonomy and can give in large part order. We can in large part order our lives however we want. But when men and women driven by love freely choose to give up their autonomy to limit their freedom by committing themselves to the good of the spouse, love is then so powerful that it impels them to want to surrender their will to their beloved in this very profound way. Indeed, many marriages today would be stronger if only we understood and remembered the kind of self-giving love we originally signed up for. Mm -hmm. When we make our vows, we freely and lovingly choose to surrender our wills to our spouse. As John Paul II explains, the fullest, the most uncompromising form of love consists precisely in self-giving in making one's inalienable and non-transferable I someone else's property. Hmm. It's beautiful. Beautiful, but very hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, call to sanctity. Call sanctity, yes. Very true. Yeah, I think I think it's, yeah, also, that would be also to add to the, like, indicators of sentimentality and um, kind of discerning if this relationship very sentimentally fixated or how what kind of way it's going out i think that's very important i think this in this sort of a way how you view each other in a relationship so the good couples like the, the couples that are really devoted to each other that are really want to give their eye to the other um their couples don't want to plan plan mm. together talk together make decisions together they're they're willing to talk willing like to very open and desire that that unity, that togetherness. And that starts from the very beginning. I think that's very important. That that's already is a very good sign mm. that this relationship is based on something true, real, and firm. Yes, communication, all of these, yeah, super important. Yeah. It's that kind of thinking of the other. It starts very early. It doesn't mm -hmm, start mm -hmm. when you start thinking, oh, maybe we need to discern, mm -hmm. should we get engaged anytime soon? That really starts when you have said yes to being their girlfriend or boyfriend. Like that started from the beginning when you said, yes, I yeah. want to be your girlfriend. I want, yes, I, yes, I accept that. That discernment process already started. So yeah. your, your discernment towards marriage, that thinking of you're not on your own anymore. You are yeah. on this journey with another person. So what you choose and what you decide to make, it's, mm -hmm. it already starts from then. Even the very initial conversation, you know, the man approaches the woman, right? Pursues the woman, says hello, right? So Jason Everett worded this beautifully once. He said, you know, I'd rather face the possibility of rejection than lose the possibility of ever having won you or getting to know you. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to face the possibility of rejection again, 
self-sacrifice, right? You're putting yourself, you're not hiding behind a rock. You're doing an actual courageous thing. You're going out in a limb. You're saying, okay, I'm going to face the possibility of rejection rather than to live the rest of my life without having the opportunity to get to know you. You know, so that's essentially you're, you're initiating love. Um, so I think that's really beautiful. And I think that's a good thing for a man to do, uh, to be honest. Uh, personally, I think, I mean, I'm not saying it can't work the other way, but it's a good, it's, it's an, a nice example of masculine love to be able to sort of make this initial first mover, self-sacrifice, self-sacrificial kind of move. Uh, so it's nice. Yeah. Right from the beginning. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, yeah, I think women, as women, what we can do is we can drop the handkerchief is the <laughs> phrase. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can kind of, um, I think it's so important, like biblically and just, it's important to stick to tradition. I think sometimes yeah. we might be wanting to conform and neuter, neuter things and make them a bit more neutralized and make it kind of a bit more compatible with today's society. And mm. of course, we're equal in dignity. And that's so important. And that does not disintegrate or change the fact that, you know, that it's still okay to allow the man to be the first. And and that is that has been the case. That has been always been in kind mm. of instituted and has been given kind of ordained in the sense that sort of way and I think that's a really good thing I think it's important to reclaim that allow that to happen and as women we can drop a handkerchief you know mm -hmm. if, if if that's something that and a lot of people metaphorically speaking metaphorically speaking yeah, yeah not actually a good yeah, these days probably yeah <laughs> you know but like there was like this this video um I think it was I think it was uh, Emily Wilson and she was just saying like um, mm. I know she was just saying like men like being given like tasks. They like being given responsibility, uh, majority of them. And, mm. you know, she was just saying like, it's really important to allow that to happen because sometimes as women, we tend to like want to do things because our world gives us everything to do it on our own. Mm. And it doesn't help to cultivate this desire for us to be more receptive and also for a man to be more, um, I suppose, initiative. Um, and so it's important to, allow like situations like she was saying like girls to like you know oh can you hold this can you help me with this or kind of like mm. oh i'm gonna go i'm gonna i'm gonna go to the bathroom um can you mind my coach or, like it's just so simple but it was just yeah. like and they were also like little starter conversations that she was you know prompting the girls like if you want to have a starter conversation with a the guy these are good little starter conversations like you know the handkerchief moments if you want to call them that way um so it was just like yeah i think it's really important to um, allow that to happen um, and I think we need to kind of change in a sense like redefine the way relationships are being seen and projected right now in this day and age mm -hmm. and I think it's important not to conform to the world but be open to the renewal of your mind <laughs> I would say, say um, I was watching, listening to some sort of relationship advice videos uh, recently and one common thing that I noticed was that what do men want? Men want, men like to feel appreciated. Um, so I would say as well, like if a guy approaches you, does actually approach you, even if you've no interest at all in the guy, to just appreciate that that was essentially an act of love, as long as he does it respectfully, obviously. If he respectfully approaches you and sort of tries to have a conversation with you, wants to get to know you, um, you know, especially, you know, in a Catholic situation, like just take it with grace. Like obviously uh, show appreciation that he did actually make that sort of initiation of love. Um, and you can also, you can also say no to him in a very graceful way as well, you know, uh, but in, you know, just to be maintain respect and things like that, because, you know, if he's showing you respect, it's, it's good to show respect back. I was talking to some international uh, people recently about this topic and uh, they were saying that Irish guys used to tell them that like Irish girls shut them down. They're so cruel when they try to talk to them when they go out <laughs> places. They they approach yeah. them and they tell them to like get lost using really colorful language or just yeah. really aggressive, like shut them down immediately. So therefore, Irish guys apparently, according to these my international friends, said they don't approach uh, Irish women anymore. They they started talking to international women because they're more receptive, more traditionally receptive. Maybe it's something to do with their cultures. Maybe that's an element of of you know depending on where they're from as well. But I know it is, it's definitely become a thing, I think, in Ireland. And I think it's sort of maybe this sort of third wave feminism kind of thing as well. You know, uh, 
I'm not sure. It's just the way people meet, the way people, the things that are socially acceptable to do, like approaching somebody in, in a public place and saying hello. Some people deem that as being shockingly <laughs> inappropriate these days. And it's very difficult for people to know where they stand. So if a guy does approach you respectfully and, and says hello, you know, it's good from a Catholic perspective to try and show appreciation to that. I mean, I, I, don't, I can only say so much as a guy himself, but uh, myself, but uh, it's just something I've heard. So, yeah. Mm, it's good to hear that. It's good to hear that for yeah. all the women out there. <laughs> yeah, because it's terrifying. It is terrifying. I'll tell you this. Any guy will tell you. It's terrible. The fear you feel of, the fear of rejection you feel when you're going up to a beautiful woman. You're shaking in your boots and you, just, you try to get a sentence out that's somewhere coherent. And it's absolutely terrifying. Because of this, you really are going out on a limb. The woman has all the cards on her table. She can crush you with a single look. Um... And you are really, in that moment, submitting completely to the woman um, in going out, uh, going out to meet her. So it is, it is really, uh, it's something that, that if a man does it, it's like, oh, fair enough, as long as he does it respectfully. <laughs> and just to encourage men, like women actually do like that. Like, you know, women who are, especially in the faith, like all, the women, all my friends that are, um, in Christian circles, like they would all say they really do value that and they desire that. And just to kind of really, yeah, I think just to encourage guys that that's, that's fantastic. You know, if you're doing that and, you know, thank you so much, you know, thank you so much for doing that and for trying your best in this, as you said, this really difficult, like culture that we're in society and just, yeah, I'm sure you're, it's not easy. I think it's actually worse. Like they say it's bad for women. I actually think it's worse for men. I think it's worse for men in um, this day and age uh, to uphold their dignity, to uphold their masculinity, uh, to be a, a man in this day and age and not to be hit from left, right and center. You know, you have one bashing saying that they're too, you know, brood or too strong, whatever, too vulgar, whatever, too objectifying women. Then you have the other side that, oh, they're too weak, they're they're not strong enough that they're too, mm. you know, sensitive or too like don't do enough mm. or don't approach whatever. You just have these both polar opposite views. I don't, yeah. you know, it's not easy. And they don't meld either. <laughs> it's like you want your cake and you want to eat it, but really it's like, you know, Jordan Peterson says, if you're afraid of, if you're if you're fearful of a strong man, just wait and see what a weak man can do. Uh, that's what you should really be afraid of, your weak men. Uh, they're far more dangerous. You know, a strong man is actually something good. Um, weak men uh, destroy nations. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So we'll probably, we should probably leave it there, right? Somewhere around now. Yes. Any final words? Any any final events? Any shout outs you want to give? Come to our Pursue Love Conference. Come to yes. that. And also... Uh, weekly prayer meetings. Weekly prayer meetings. And also come to our Christmas uh, dinner on the 5th of January, the... Uh, black tie event www.pureinheart.ie contact us please god bless you all <laughs>